So um, the story the movie tells um, and that Layla, the main protagonist, goes through, um, they're partially based on your personal experience. Um, how do you feel about sharing such an intimate um, experience with a public audience? <laughs> it's always hard. You're like, if they don't like the movie, they don't like me. <laughs> no pressure. Um, I have to say, you know, in the, the first screen at Sundance was really hard because not only I had literally finished the film two days before, um, it was weird because I was like, who are all these people in my sound mix, you know? Um, I think the one thing is that when you make a film, it's in some ways no longer yours, right? When you make any piece of work, any art, any painting, at some point it's for the audience, it's for the public. So I think I've gotten over the element of being terrified because it's my story. I think I decided that when I wrote it, when I made it. Now I'm interested in how it affects other people. Like I had so many people come up to me yesterday. They were German, they loved it. And, but also I was particularly interested and in one of the reasons I came to the Munich Festival was because the Germany, I had spent a lot of time here in December doing post-production. A lot of my friends from Iran have come to Germany, emigrated here as artists. Um, and it's a lot of Turkish, Iranian, Kurdish. I was very taken with this. You know, I've seen it in France, I've seen it in England. I thought it's very much a story of Germany too, of Europe. They, also the programmers wrote it this way. But I think at some point I was very touched. Yesterday a Kurdish boy came up to me, this is so much like my family, or a Turkish, a Turkish woman came to me and said, I'm you know, second generation, but I feel this is my story. An Iranian, another Iranian filmmaker came to me, he lives in Cologne. He said, this is my grandparents' story. Or someone said, it's not my story at all, but you know, it's cool to see Muslims not be gangsters, you know? Yeah. So I think all of these things are kind of important for me to understand with, that the audience takes away, but at some point it's no longer my film, it's the film of the audience and I hope it touches me to see how it affects people or, or people, the woman, people behind me were crying so much. I felt guilty, I'm sorry, I hope I don't ruin your makeup. <laughs> um, it's, it becomes their experience, you know, and I, and I think, and that's the way I'm so happy the film will be in cinemas and not only on, it'll be on streaming later, but it'll be in Germany and Europe and America. Because I think also there's a collective aspect to watching a movie, you know. That's why I like to go to the movies, because you come out of your house and you're not only watching the movie, you're watching the movie with these people at this moment in your life, in their lives. There is an energy, I felt such an interesting energy last night watching it in the cinema. And I hope that people connect to the film and to each other in watching the film in a public setting. Why a comedy? Um, well, I think part of the reason I wrote this story in particular was like during the Trump era, uh, immigrants were being vilified, particularly Iran, the Muslim ban. I felt it wasn't very authentic to my experience and I wanted to do something personal. And I want to do something fun. And I, when I think of my family, and I think of, yes, is we have a lot of trauma and drama, but I think what gets us through is our humor. And I think it was important. I didn't want to make this film ever if it was a, only a drama. I mean, that's one way to make the film, but I felt it's, I, I felt like we didn't need that. I, I didn't need that. I think I survived Trump by watching Saturday Night Live and watching comedy skits. And I think that's how we get through hard political, economic, social times. I really wanted the joy to be the thing that you're left with. I, I wanted, in the end, you might cry, you might have all these things, you might understand my family, but I hope at the end you feel joy and hope. And I, I needed that myself, honestly. That's why I wrote it. I felt a little bit hope, hopeless at the time. Yeah, it's really good and it's also different because um, oftentimes when you have such a difficult topic, it's really mostly serious, so right. um, it was really refreshing to yeah. see such an approach. I think people appreciate that. I, I think if we could find a way to like talk about issues but also have fun and be entertained, and I think that's also life, you know, it's like how, how do we get through hard days? Um, yeah, um, what was your journey to filmmaking like actually? To make, become a filmmaker? Yeah, yeah, what did um, you, what motivated you to get into it? 9-11. Um, so in, during 9-11, uh, most of my brothers actually were working right across from the Twin Towers. I was on sabbatical at, um, in Berkeley. I was doing a PhD in actually Middle Eastern studies and literature based on uh, looking more at women, like women's studies. 
So I was at Berkeley, and as you know, it's three hours difference than New York. So I was asleep, and I kept hitting the alarm. And at the time, I told my, uh, my ex-wife, I was like, oh my god, um, I had a weird dream that a plane hit the Twin Towers. I just said, what? Because I had kept hitting snooze. I was hearing the news. Yeah. Because by the time I woke up, the towers had fallen. And I couldn't get in touch with my family. I know my brothers work very close by. I didn't know what happened. And I remember, like, I can't remember what publication on the cover it said, those bastards. And I said, oh, who are those? Are those me? Like, who do you mean by those? And I saw in the media, quickly, you know, we created all the false stories around Iraq and about, you know, the weapons of mass destruction. You know, it became, again, we became enemies, you know, as Iranians, as Muslims. And I really decided to leave academia and go into film. I made, in response to 9-11, with just friends from Berkeley, we made a, uh, made a black and white film on 16 millimeter. I didn't make it to go to film school. I just, it was my expression. And my brother at the time, who had worked across from the Twin Towers, he said, let's go into film. Let's change the world. So I submitted this film to NYU. I wrote an essay, and I won a full scholarship to do my master's at NYU. And it was important for me to tell stories from my part of the world that were not what the media was telling. Because especially after 9-11, every Iranian, Arab, they didn't even care what language you spoke. In, in many American TV shows, actors were speaking different languages. One person was speaking Pashtun, one speaker was speaking Persian, Arabic, and they were supposed to be in the same scene. There was no care or thought given to who we were. And it was very dehumanizing. And it's one of the reasons I became a filmmaker. And this particularly, this film, because I had never seen a film growing up ever. I loved uh, Joy Luck Club. I loved Scorsese, was a huge influence. I loved so many films, but they were not us, you know? So it was, I felt like it's time for me to make my great immigrant story to be, you know, reflect who we are. Really, because I had never seen it. And I, I was selfishly wanting to see our, our, you know, our own faces on the screen. It had nothing to do with terrorism and had nothing to do with drug dealing or all these other things that we typically or stereotypically see. And um, also, um, the situation in 2017 with the Muslim ban, you um, wrote that your family was directly affected by it. Um, how has the situation changed in the US or maybe worldwide, or has it changed at all? Honestly, and I was very politically active during this time, like working in translations and helping people who were trying to come in. It hasn't changed that much. You know, my editor, he's British. Yeah. He came to England maybe 20 years ago. He's won so many awards as an editor. He's done big Amazon shows, shows that have, films that have been nominated for BAFTA. He's married to a British woman. He has his master's in the UK. He has a British daughter. He's British. Yeah. He has a British passport. He was denied entry to the US for Sundance. Yes, he's a second class citizen. He doesn't hold the same British passport as a white British man. It still affects people. It's very heartbreaking that he could not come because of the, some elements of the band still are in place. So I think, you know, that's heartbreaking to me. The fact also that as a European, you have two classes of citizens, essentially. He's not the same as, his wife could go to the premiere, but not him. This is horrible, yes. really. So, so I think, you know, it's still, it's still ongoing. Yeah, that's really bad. Do you think it would change in the future, maybe with more films like yours? Do you think that um, maybe giving it a platform, there will be a lot of movement, maybe in the industry and maybe like in the general public image? I think I'm not sure what would go on in terms of like the laws around these issues of the Muslim ban and or elements of it that remain. But I think importantly, I think it's, you know, I think I read an article once that said 80 something percent or 90 percent of Americans have never met a Muslim. Yet they have all these concepts of it. And it's not only, okay, discrimination within our country, it affects our foreign policy. You know, we're going bombing countries that have nothing to do with 9-11 because we, you know, we, we link them incorrectly to 9-11. We've destroyed the Middle East. It's, it, it makes me so sad. Every country I love, Lebanon, Syria, um, every, uh, Egypt, uh, Iran, all these countries have been literally destroyed in the post 9-11 world. And a lot of that has to do with American foreign policy. So I think they affect each other in some ways. Because if you are able to dehumanize a people, you don't care that you go to Iraq and bomb them. But we do care as Americans about Ukraine. You know, 
Americans are outraged about Ukraine. They're not outraged about Syria. That breaks my heart. We should take Ukrainian refugees. We should, Uber should give money. British Airways asked me to give money for the Ukrainians, and they don't ask to give money for the Syrian refugees or for Iraqi, all the refugees, so many refugees around the world. We just saw how many refugees just died this week. You know, why is one refugee, is it because they're European? Is it because they're blonde? These are valuable, those are not. I'm not, I, I support, of course, Ukrainian refugees, and that's not my point, but my point is, what, are the, what is the public moved by? Why are you moved by this story and not that? Yeah. So I think that's an important question to ask ourselves.